Hello, I'm Dr. Barbara Kostick. We have many questions when we know of someone who has been diagnosed with cancer. A treatment option may be radiation therapy. Today on Voices in Health, we demystify the Radiation Oncology Center. The Washington Radiation Oncology Center has been providing radiation therapy services to the community since 1984. Utilizing state-of-the-art technology, the center offers the latest advances in radiation therapy and treatment planning. A board-certified radiation oncology specialist, Dr. Michael Bestache has been practicing with Washington Hospital since 2006. To help demystify radiation oncology, let's first address radiation treatment and its role in cancer therapy. Welcome, Dr. Bastache. Can you tell us what a cancer is? Sure, Barbara. A cancer is the unregulated growth of normal cells. These cells can transform themselves into perpetual cells that will spread to other organs and can lead to the patient's ultimate death. So it can go to other organs or it can grow bigger right where it is. To Correct. Do. Typically the, it starts as a localized process and then those cells can travel through the bloodstream, for example, to other organs uh, or to other lymph nodes and from there cause further problems. Well, what about radiation? How does that kill the cancer? Sure. Radiation is uh, a method by which the DNA, which is the foundation of the cell, is damaged. When the damaged cell attempts to divide, it cannot do so correctly and then is killed, basically. And there are other ways that it works in addition to damaging the DNA of the cell. It also inhibits the abnormal growth of the supporting blood vessels. So there are many ways that uh, radiation can affect uh, the death of a tumor. And the DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, and, and is that one of the ways that they find out that it is a cancer, isn't it? By looking at the cells under a microscope and seeing that it's, it's multiplying more? Correct. There are uh, pathologic uh, stains that can be done mm -hmm. to help determine what type of cancer it is and how quickly it's dividing, and that provides important clinical data for the physicians treating the patient. So are some cancers more uh, amenable to radiation than other cancers? Well, virtually all tumors exhibit some degree of sensitivity to radiation. Certain tumors uh, are much more sensitive than others, so it is very specific to the patient and, you know, really to the overall mm -hmm. plan of cure for the patient. Now, with radiation, it's a component in multiple tumor sites, for example, breast cancer. So in that tumor, we have to consider multiple ways of treating the patient. Um, the classic thought is, of course, surgery, which effectively treats the local area that's affected. Now, the rest of the breast may harbor microscopic deposits of disease, and that's when radiation can play a role in sterilizing the remaining breast tissue of microscopic areas of disease. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, chemotherapy is important to control any disease that may have left the breast and traveled to the lymph nodes or to other organs. Well, what is the difference between radiation and chemotherapy? Well, Barbara, that's a great question. Chemotherapy is taken either through the IV, which is through the vein, or as a pill, and of course it's go, it goes through the bloodstream to all organs, so enti your entire body is affected. Whereas radiation is local therapy, so only the area that is irradiated is affected. Well, does radiation work different on different kinds of cancers? No, essentially radiation's effects are on principally two areas. Number one would be the DNA, which is really the blueprint of how the cell functions. And number two, on the vasculature that supports uh, the tumor. And the radiation damages the DNA, so when the cell attempts to divide, it's not able to divide correctly, mm -hmm. and because of that, the cell dies. When the radiation affects the vasculature that's growing, those cells are also dividing, their DNA is damaged, 
and they die. So it's really a two-pronged approach, and together, that's how radiation causes its effects. But certain tumors are more sensitive than other tumors? Correct. There are certain uh, molecular uh, mutations that can lead to resistance to radiation. In other words, the damage to the DNA is repaired more effectively in certain tumors than in others. And what tumors are more susceptible for radiation? For example, testicular tumors, such as what Lance Armstrong had, for example, mm -hmm. classically thought of as a very radiosensitive tumor, lymphomas, uh, breast cancers, those are relatively radiosensitive tumors. What about prostate? Prostate cancer is also a sensitive tumor to radiation, provided sufficient dose is delivered. And in the past, there was difficulty delivering sufficiently high levels of radiation safely. But with the emergence of better technology, we can provide a sufficient dose to the prostate gland to kill the tumor, mm -hmm. but sparing severe effects to the rectum and to the bladder. The way we do that is through intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is uh, on the forefront of how we deliver the radiation. The radiation is mm -hmm. the same, but the method of mm -hmm. delivery is improved. Well, not only prostate, but what about breast cancer, too? Yeah, breast cancer has undergone an evolution in how we treat it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are able to spare more effectively lung and heart tissue if it's in the field, and thereby we decrease the incidence of late side effects. Well, we've started, we've gone from the prostate to the breast. What about the head and neck? Well, in head and neck cancers, radiation is a very effective means to uh, destroy a tumor because in many of these areas, the anatomy is unfavorable for a complete surgical excision. Mm -hmm. And so radiation can reach those areas where uh, the scalpel cannot. So uh, we can, in combination with chemo often in head and neck cancers, eradicate uh, those tumors with a high degree of success. Mm -hmm. Does age or sex play any role in having radiation or not having radiation? No, they're not exclusionary criteria. I, patients who are 95 uh, tolerate radiation therapy. Women and men tolerate them equally. I, I always say that it's always easier to do women. They're, they're generally tougher, I would say. <laughs> you know, they're, they, they know how to give birth and men uh, sometimes are not as, as tough as they look. Mm -hmm. For a new patient recently diagnosed with cancer, the process of radiation treatment may seem overwhelming. The first appointment at the center is an initial consultation. The next appointment will be a simulation appointment, which involves getting a CT scan to define the treatment field positions. Then the CT scan is reviewed and the treatment plan is developed. This could take up to a week. Once the treatment plan has been completed, a verification appointment is scheduled where the x-ray film is taken to verify the treatment placement. The treatment then begins the next day. The number of radiation treatments vary. It depends on the location and the type of cancer. Typical treatment courses can range from 25 to 40 treatments. Dr. Pistache, why so many treatments? Well, you know, originally when they treated it with Madame Curie mm -hmm. back in the 19-teens and 20s, they didn't know anything about what we term fractionation, which is taking the total dose and then dividing that over a number of treatment days. And what they found, essentially, through trial and error, was that if you delivered large fractions, or so large amounts of radiation, over a very short period of time, while tumor control was good, the side effect profile was not good when you followed mm -hmm. patients long term. So therefore, the idea developed that if you took the same amount of radiation and divided the dose over a number of treatment days, that one could achieve equivalent cure and outcome, mm -hmm. but not have as many side effects. Very good. Well, let's talk a little more about the process that, that we heard about. You know, it seems like there's a lot more to it than just go in and say, hey, doc, here I am, ready for my radiation. Right. It's, it's no different from anything else that's complex. Mm -hmm. Whether you're getting on an airplane or going for surgery, you need to have a little uh, preparation. So uh, I would meet with the patient, discuss the patient's 
cancer and the plan of treatment. Often the plan of treatment evolves in the context of meeting with the radiologist, the oncologist who delivers the chemotherapy, and the surgeon in order to understand best what is going on inside the patient. Once I meet with the patient, then the patient returns for a CT scan. That CT scan is used to map out the tumor and where we're going to be treating. Well, and, and I guess you also have to take into account when the patient's breathing or if they have, you know, movable organs, are they out of the way of the, of the fields and so that you, you make sure that you get the field right where the tumor is. Absolutely. So it's a dynamic process because we're moving all the time even if we don't think we are. Our, our organs are moving. So, you know, that's a, it's an evolving aspect in radiation therapy. And, you know, in fact, we're getting technology here at Washington that will help to track the tumor, and that's called image-guided radiotherapy, which will be coming here by the summer of 2008. So that's a very exciting and innovative field in radiation therapy. So once the patient's plan is complete, mm -hmm. the patient returns, and undergoes some quality assurance films, and then the patient starts, and then periodically, during the treatment, we take films that really make sure the patient is in the correct position daily, uh, and then at the end of treatment, we wait, because there's a, quite a bit of inflammation, so sometimes imaging immediately after we're done is not accurate. So we wait usually six to eight weeks to allow any inflammation caused by the radiation to go away, and then we re-image, and that image is typically to establish a new baseline. Unlike surgery where the tumor is cut out and it's on the table for the pathologist to look at, you know, in radiation it, it's really up to the body to reabsorb the tumor and anybody who's cut himself knows that it takes time for that wound to heal and, and likewise in the body it, it takes time for the body to reabsorb the dead tumor. So even if you can detect a mass either by feeling it or on imaging, that doesn't necessarily mean that the cancer is alive, and it just takes a little time for the tumor to be reabsorbed. Or the inflammation around right. it to go down. Right. And as you said, you know, the radiation affects the blood vessels, too. Absolutely. So those have to shrink back down, too. So it's a, it's a process, and, you know, we, we deliver radiation therapy over a number of weeks, and so I would expect that, you know, every tumor is going to take a number of weeks to respond because, as I said before, the radiation affects the tumor when the cell attempts to divide. Mm -hmm. So depending on how quickly a tumor cell is dividing dictates how quickly a response will appear. What are the common questions patients ask you? Well, why can't I start today? There, well, we explained that. And I think that. you explained that. I mean, it's like okay. you don't want to hop on an airplane that's not been fully looked at. Um, you know, the other ones are why does it take so long, which is, we've gone over that. Mm -hmm. What are the side effects? And you know, that's highly specific, but in general, nowadays, the side effects, while not minimal, are, are very manageable. And I think most patients are very worried about, you know, their, their skin or, you know, pain. And those are all easily managed uh, currently. The technology that we have now allows us to deliver radiation much more safely than even 10 years ago. So if you had a relative who had a bad experience with radiation 10 years ago, that experience is unlikely to reoccur because as with everything else in medicine, we've gotten better at catching the mouse. Very good. And, and you know, we, we used to in the old days have one person take care of one problem. And it, it seems like cancer is an issue that you really need a team instead of just one person. What do you think of that concept? Well, that's the prevailing uh, way to treat cancer currently. You know, as we evolve into the molecular aspect of cancer, mm -hmm. we, we, it really gets very much complicated because we just don't have one type of breast cancer or one type of colon cancer. Really, we, we can deal with many different subtypes and we're getting to the point where we can individualize treatment. Now, as we get more sophisticated, it becomes more complicated. So mm -hmm. we have tumor boards and we have a, a wonderful breast tumor board here at Washington Hospital at the Women's Center that really individualizes treatment for the patient. And so the patient is presented at the tumor board mm -hmm. and, and you're there mm -hmm. for radiation and I guess and the doctors there that would provide chemo if chemo is needed and Correct. The surgeons there that did the surgery. and Yeah, so it seems like this team approach is, really helps the patient. 
it, it really helps to, first of all, streamline the process because everybody's on board. Mm -hmm. We all understand what is going on. Mm -hmm. We all communicate because we're sitting there next to each other. And I think it really helps to encourage uh, crosstalk between physicians in different specialties because mm -hmm. not any one physician can keep abreast, no pun intended, yeah. of every new bit of data that's coming out about breast, camp breast cancer, for example. So I think that it's a great opportunity to provide optimal care, and it's somewhat unique here in the East Bay to have that. Well, let's keep demystifying some of these myths. We've sure. already said that colon cancer isn't just colon cancer, breast cancer isn't just breast cancer. There's lots of different cancers. There's, you know, you've said about chemo versus radiation. Well, what happens in radiation still? Do you go in, do, is it noisy? No, so essentially, everyone's had a chest x-ray, or they at least mm -hmm. know what that's like. Now, re therapeutic radiation is simply on the other end of the spectrum. So if uh, a chest x-ray is at a kilovoltage, you know, therapeutic radiation is at a megavoltage. And you don't smell, hear, taste, or during the therapy feel any differently from how you feel when you get a chest x-ray. You don't feel warm, mm -hmm. for example. If I were to irradiate a cup of coffee one degree, that's enough energy that would, it would kill you. So you don't really feel anything during the radiation. Mm. Now afterwards, for example, if we irradiate someone's stomach, an hour or two afterwards mm -hmm. there may be some nausea. But that's only if we treat someone's stomach or someone's small bowel. Okay. Uh, you know, other side effects that are more general are, for example, fatigue. Now that starts, you know, midway to the end of treatment and it affects different people differently. And I think it's important to, re to remember that, you know, you can get through this. The human body is extremely resilient. And, you know, if you come in in good shape, you'll really tolerate the therapy very well. And, you know, there are also emotional costs to being diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And that, that also takes a toll. So it's important uh, in my clinic to take care of the whole person, mm -hmm. um, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. It, it really all plays a role in the overall care of the patient. Well, you mentioned some of the new technology that's coming down. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on it? Right. Well, you know, Washington Hospital is in the very unique position of having some of the premier equipment in radiation therapy. We have the Gamma Knife, which is specialized for brain cancers and other tumors in the brain. Mm -hmm. And then we have intensity modulated radiotherapy here. We've had this here for several years. And we're going to be getting new uh, equipment for image-guided radiotherapy. The exciting part of image-guided radiotherapy is the capacity to track the position of the patient and to increase the accuracy of the delivery of radiation therapy. Now, the reason that's important is if we can deliver therapy more accurately, we can increase the dose to the tumor while reducing the dose to the surrounding normal tissue. So if we can increase the dose to the tumor, the hope is that we can cure more tumors mm -hmm. while not causing excessive or even increased toxicity. And the hope really is that we will decrease toxicity. So, Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah. I think what, what I'm getting from you is that so you have a cancer in a certain area, and by using this wonderful new technique, it will be able to monitor that that cancer is shrinking or growing more on one side and less on another so that you can redo your, your plan halfway through the cycle? Or? Right, so sometimes we can do that just by, we can see the tumor shrink, mm -hmm. so we can do that. And other times, it's even simpler than that. We, okay. we just need to make sure that the patient is correctly aligned every day. And with this technology, that is more precise, which allows us to treat the tumor more effectively while sparing the normal tissue. Well, I think, you know, a lot of patients do f worry about that they have to lie on a flat bed right. and not have any support and not be able to move. And you're telling me now you're going to be able to, to give people a little bit of relief from that because you can... Well, not the it. hard table. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's, still, okay. that's still part of the game because mm -hmm. it is important that we... Um, well, we can put a pad on the, on the table or have you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the table is hard because we have to make sure that the whole body is in the correct position and they frankly don't roll off. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. And uh, so, you know, it, it's just part of the game. And we can work with people who have 
you know, sore backs or have bad arthritis in their joints. And it's one of those things where it's only about 15 minutes. So for most patients, while it's not exactly a spa, you know, laying on the table, mm -hmm. it's not horrible. So they can, they can tolerate it for a good period of time, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so again, explain to me why it's gonna be so wonderful to have this computer guided. Well, what it does is it, it, tracks the, it tracks the patient and it can track the tumor. If you put uh, ra uh, seeds, for example, little pellets of metal inside, for example, the prostate, okay. one can then track the prostate because the prostate is, is not a static organ. It will move dependent on the volume of urine in the bladder and stool and feces in the rectum because it sits between those two organs. So it, it, sits, it flops back and forth on a fulcrum. And so if you, if you can match that and track that, then your treatment is more accurate. And, and less likely to get damage exactly. to the colon or the bladder exactly. while you're treating the prostate. Exactly. Jeanette Lingle is a breast cancer survivor. In June of 2007, she had her yearly mammography at Washington Hospital. The result was something she thought she would never experience. She had non-invasive breast cancer, stage zero. After two lumpectomies and seven weeks of radiation therapy, Jeanette and her doctors can declare that her breast cancer is controlled. Welcome, Jeanette. We're glad you're here, and I'll bet you're glad you're here, too. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Tell us about your story. I have been getting regular mammograms for 16 years, and last June, microcalcifications were found in my right breast as a result of a digital mammogram. As a result of a screening mammography. So you just went in, you had no symptoms? No. No, there were no lumps. There was nothing. No, um, it was just my annual mammogram. Just your annual yes. mammogram. And in this case, it was a digital mammogram, which was a new um, technology mm -hmm. that was available at Washington Hospital. Mm -hmm. And that proved to, it, it identified um, some microcalcifications, and a biopsy indicated that I required a lumpectomy. And following that lumpectomy, uh, we were not quite within the margins, so I had a second lumpectomy. And then that was followed by seven weeks of radiation treatment. And since then I've had uh, an MRI that has indicated that I'm all clear. And the results of the second lumpectomy were no residual carcinoma. So oh, that's I'm wonderful. very pleased. So you had no real risk factors. You were just doing your annual mammography and, and they found it. I didn't know I had risk factors. The day before my biopsy, I have a distant cousin, a cousin in my generation, but a cousin who called the day before just to say hi and I learned that she also had right breast cancer oh my and goodness. had gone through a similar treatment three years before so um, but otherwise no it was a complete surprise to me because I my mother has had no issues well tell us about your experience what did you see when you met Dr. Bastage well I have three physicians that I'm uh, that are helping me and one is my surgeon Dr. William Degoni and then Dr. Michael Bastash is my radiation oncology oncologist. Mm -hmm. And then um, Dr. David Chang is my oncologist. And so I was referred to Dr. Bastash and went in. And just as um, you were saying earlier, there was a CT scan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just to kind of map out mm -hmm. what needed to be done. And then I began the radiation treatment. And from the moment you walk through the door at the radiation center, uh, the radiation oncology center, there's warmth, there's support, compassion, and healing. They are knowledgeable, encouraging, comforting. They are compassionate. Um, as Dr. Bustash said, the first three weeks or so, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Then things start getting a little uncomfortable. You do start feeling the fatigue. That was my experience. And I did start burning underneath my arm and underneath my breast. And so a medication, a cream was recommended and that helped quite a bit. There's also a poncho type gown that you wear for um, specifically the women for breast cancer um, radiation, I believe. And 
it has the coolest feel to it. It's cotton. But I noticed about the fourth week I put it on and I thought, you know, this is really comfortable. And so I asked if I could borrow some and there was no hesitation to take some home and in the privacy of my home to be able to wear that and be more comfortable. What was your greatest fear when you found out you had cancer? I don't think in, in my case, I really stopped to feel fear. I just started speaking with my different physicians and there were just things that needed to be done. So you just and took it that just, this is a problem, let's take care of it? Yes, as a matter of fact. This is a problem, let's take care of it and see where it takes us. Um, three weeks ago when I had my MRI, which was a six month follow up, um, in that particular instance I had to wait five days for the results. And I went through a very difficult time of thinking I could never do this again. And about three days into that, I thought, yes, you would. You'd do it again because I'm here and I'm healthy and uh, the process works. And I've had a fantastic team taking care of me, not only the physicians, but their staff as well. Did, you got told of different side effects that could happen. Was there anyone that, that you were worried about more than the others? No, but I was not expecting the burning, in my instance, to be as uncomfortable as mm -hmm. it was. But just as Dr. Bastash said earlier, it's all manageable. And that's something I wanted to say today is, you go through it, you take it one day at a time. The fatigue is real, you take a nap if you need to take a nap. If you're, um, you talk with other people. The other thing that has been just so helpful is before I even had my first lumpectomy, I went to a breast cancer support group meeting at Washington Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I met ladies who are 11, 12 year survivors and two year survivors. Mm -hmm. And others that were just going through chemo and um, just felt so much strength, took away so much strength from that experience. And then in one of the more recent meetings, there was a patient or um, someone who was about to start her radiation. Mm -hmm. And I was able to say to her, it's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. And this is what to expect. You talked about sounds earlier. The machines make a little bit of a sound. There's a little bit of a zapping <laughs> sound. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I'd get a couple dosages from this direction and mm -hmm. some more heavier dosages or at least length of time mm -hmm. from this direction. First few times I started counting how many seconds, so then I thought, oh no, you're not gonna keep doing this for seven weeks, so you think of other things and before you know it, it's done. The most uncomfortable thing for me was actually having my arm up over my head, which is the position that you have to be in. And um, that as far as any discomfort, any pain whatsoever during the treatment, mm -hmm. there's none, there's none at all. So no, it was, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing to have had it detected so early, mm -hmm. to have a wonderful team taking care of me, for the people that I've met along the way, and the people that have given to me, and people that I feel that I can share now my experience. So okay, that, uh, it's your choice now here, it's your opportunity. <laughs> you, you're gonna tell the people out there, what are they supposed to do if they have to undergo radiation? Give them some hints. You said take a nap, <laughs> well, but it's amazing how people come into your life. That's been my experience. Our paths have crossed that have had similar experiences or family members that have. And so for me, you don't keep it to yourself. You talk. You go to a, a, a cancer support group meeting. You talk in depth with your physicians. And in my case, I've been speaking with all three and talking about what we've talked about mm -hmm. together so that I know we're all on the same page as to what we want to be doing. Um, don't fear it. There is discomfort, but it is temporary. And when you think of the long-term benefits, it's worth all of it. And the staff and, the, and everyone at the Radiation Oncology Center um, is just a very warm, compassionate group of people. And five days a week for seven weeks may sound like a lot, mm -hmm. but it is only, as you said, 15 minutes mm -hmm. except for the days that you need an x-ray taken mm -hmm. and things like that. And yes, you are laying on a very hard table, it but, 
But the staff has this way of... I've laid on it, so I know it's hard. <laughs> you so. know it's hard. The staff has this way of helping you to get up. Um, there is this teamwork between the staff. Everything just flows so smoothly, and you know that you're in very good hands. They do explain what they're doing along the way. And they, if you have questions that they can't answer, or that it's not appropriate for them to answer, then they direct you mm -hmm. to Dr. Mustache or Dr. Ball. So, so that was a very positive experience. Yeah, and Barbara, I think it's important to remember um, what I think is a little known fact, that women, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, overestimate their chance of dying from breast cancer fourfold. So I think the, the psychological burden when they come in my office is, is tremendous. I mean, many of these women um, who may have been on estrogen replacement, and that's now stopped. They now get this diagnosis and think they're going to die from it. And um, their whole idea of who they are as a person mm -hmm. um, is really challenged. And then remember, women are generally the caregivers uh, in, the, in the family. And so it's very difficult all of a sudden when the caregiver gets sick I mean, the rest of the family is kind of a little bit lost, and it's a, it's a real challenge, I think, psychologically sometimes mm -hmm. for those roles to be inverted. You know, I, I'll never forget, I, I treated a, a veteran from Korea. He said, look, I went through the Korean War in 18 years as a lineman for the electrical company. I'm not afraid of prostate cancer. You know, he just went right through it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, breast cancer tends to strike women in their 50s and 60s, and it's, it's really, you know, the prime of their life and then this comes along and a lot of times their families don't really know how to react to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a very difficult thing uh, for women to deal because on top of that, they think they're gonna die from it often. And you know, a large part of their identity has been you know, violated in the sense they've had surgery and you know, it, it's a real challenge. And you've said that one of the ways for coping with that is to make sure you have a good team. Exactly. Not only the, the physicians, but also friends. And your friends. And there yeah. are friends that I've made that will be friends for life now. Well, Jeanette, why did you want to come here today? The reason that I wanted to come here today was to have the opportunity to encourage those that are considering radiation or being recommended to, to go through radiation treatment to pursue it, to speak with their radiation oncologist, to talk with others who have experienced this, and to uh, pursue it without fear. That there is discomfort, yes, it's manageable. That there is fatigue, that's true. But that too is manageable. To um, educate their family and friends, I think it's important that your family understand about the fatigue side um, so that they are supportive of that and you orchestrate your life around that for a while until that passes. Um, I think it's important for women when we're talking about breast cancer, they're the primary caregiver, but it's important for them to take care of themselves because um, it's easy to put off a mammogram. For a few weeks here, or a few months, and pretty soon, maybe a year has gone by. In my case, if I'd waited longer, it could have been a very different outcome. So I'm really blessed that it was found so early. And my second reason is that I wanted to thank the Radiation Oncology Center for all that they've done to care for me and the environment that they provided and to thank Dr. Mustache and his staff for the seven weeks that I spent with them and the, um, the comfort that I felt throughout the process and a sense of, definitely a sense of compassion and warmth. Well, we want to thank you for being here and sharing that with us. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Pistache, for coming, too. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Washington Hospital's Community Cancer Program treats over 200 new cancer patients every year with an experienced and dedicated staff, as well as exceptional education programs and support services. Our first responsibility is to our patients. Our mission is to provide high-quality, cost-effective services with consideration to the patient's privacy and dignity. For more information about the cancer program at Washington Hospital, please call 510-745-6433 or go online at whhs.com. Thank you.